Okay. Um, let's see. First of all, I apologize. Uh, the last lecture that I recorded didn't get posted until last night. Um, that will happen sometimes, but I'll try very hard to always do it uh, the evening of the lecture. And so it'll be up the next morning. Um, let's see. There was some other announcement. I can't think of what it was. But I may probably think of it later. Um, all right. So um, we're talking about evolution. And um, at the end of the last hour, um, we talked about um, there were three things that Darwin was, was uh, especially interested in uh, trying to understand. Um, and the uh, third of those was a matter of speciation. Um, and we talked a little bit about that at the end of the hour. Um, I didn't, there are a couple of terms here which I don't actually think you need to know, but I'll, I'll just bring them out anyway. Um, this sort of schema that we talked about where everything happens on the left side of the mountain, so to speak, where, where are there the different uh, 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 regions or beams in which uh, these species can survive um, are, can be communicated between the animals can, maybe with difficulty, but they can get from one to the other. Um, so that there's some gene flow between them. Um, uh, the kind of speciation we talked about there, as described here, is referred to as sympatric speciation. And there are special circumstances where it probably does occur. But it's thought by biologists to be very rare. Um, and um, uh, then the other kind, uh, which is the kind that is more common, which requires geographical isolation, which is a term I failed to put on the slide or should have. Uh, in this case, the geographical isolation is caused by a mountain. Um, it could be a body of water or something. But it's something so that there's really a barrier. I mean, just a long distance doesn't work. Because, unless it's a long distance dirt in, um, unless it's a long distance in which there are no places uh, partway between the two spots where the species can survive. Um, so it's got to be that um, they really have to be isolated genetically. Um, and um, the best way to do that is with a mountain or a giant sand of water or something like that. And that's referred to as geographic isolation, which I should have on the slide and don't. But that kind of speciation, which is the kind that mostly is thought to occur, is called allopathic. Um, I don't, you don't need to remember those words, but I just I, I want to point them out. And again, what is very important that you do have to remember is that um, speciation occurs when members of an interbreeding population no longer can or will breed successfully. Um, with members of other populations. And then those two populations are said to be separate species. That's pretty much a definition. But it makes sense, because obviously once that's happened, once they're uh, reproductively isolated, they're going to go their own course of evolution independent of what the other one does. Um, so that's the uh, end of this first um, part of the evolution lecture. Um, and I want to go on now to the second part which are some applications of the theory of natural selection, the things that are of, 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 of some interest. And there are going to be a, a number of, uh, uh, of take-home messages um, uh, from this. Um, we're going to talk about three different things. The first, we're going to give you an example which illustrates that um, at least when taken at face value, there may be ways of, 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 of circumstances in which this may not always be fully the case. But at least um, when taken at face value, uh, straightforwardly, the theory of natural selection uh, makes animals with, which have traits or, um, in which uh, self-interest usually wins out. We'll just spell out what we mean by that in a few minutes. Um, it makes us, it's inclined to make us into selfish, mean-spirited individuals, each and every one of us. Um, secondly, there are some interesting things that happen when they're um, that the natural selection brings about when there is situations where there is competition between individuals over scarce resources. Um, and um, there we're going to learn something um, uh, we're going to learn something about sort of uh, 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 get a bit better insight into what, what natural selection really does. And then finally, um, because of this first item here, um, a question arises. We think that humans have altruistic traits, at least some. Um, but as pointed out up here, natural selection causes self-interest to win out. And that's just the opposite of having altruistic traits. Altruistic traits are ones in which you do something for somebody else 
<clears throat> that decreases your own reproductive fitness in the long run. I mean, it's, it, it, it hurts you, but the, the end result of the, the, the biologist's definition of altruism is some act that reduces your own reproductive fitness, your own reproductive success. Um, and um, uh, it's been very difficult for natural selection to figure out why those kinds of traits evolved. Um, and um, so we'll talk a little bit about that um, as, as a third example. Ah, important. Um, read underlined, so I wouldn't forget to say it, but I almost did. We've repeatedly made the point that all interesting psychological traits are the result of many, 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 many genes. Okay? But, as you will see when you read Dawkins, actually, I get the two things I have to tell you. If you will see when you read Dawkins, which you, I hope you've already started doing, um, there are lots of examples that he goes into where he just associates one trait with one gene. But if you read the early parts of the book, and I think I signed these parts, he makes his apologies and says that's just so that we can, I can make my arguments in a coherent way. Um, and I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So in order to get the idea for the arguments, it's very hard to talk about them if you don't just say, well, you know, this gene cause, is associated with this trait, causes this trait. But Dawkins knows, and I know, and you know now, that that's a totally unrealistic situation. But it's, to get these, it's, it's, it's a way of getting the ideas across. So be sure to keep that in mind. That's one thing I have to say. The other thing I have to say, which I should have said earlier, and I don't think I did, is that um, my le these evolution lectures as a whole, but especially this part, um, the second part of my evolution lectures, um, is very parallel to Dawkins. So whereas in the Nature Nurture uh, week, um, pretty much almost all the questions on the exam will come from my lectures. There's some readings and there's sort of added stuff, and there will be a question here and there to make sure you've done the reading, but basically the stuff that you'll really be, for the most part, examined on will be my uh, lectures. And that will be true probably for most of the rest of my part of the course as well. The picture may change for uh, the adult part. But this week, for the evolution lectures, it's pretty much even. Um, both the lectures and Dawkins are important. And in fact, I'm kind of um, channeling Dawkins. I'm, I'm explaining things a different way, but I'm explaining the same things. Okay? Um, so you really have to read the You absolutely have to read the book. Um, and you have to do my lectures. Um, and if you say, which, if I'm only going to do one, which should I do? I don't know the answer. Um, you should do both. You need to do both. Um, okay. By the way, are there any issues? Is there anything that I should have, uh, I should publish for that? Something under control? Okay. I don't mean with regard to this lecture, but just anything. Of course. Okay. okay. So the first um, situation or example we want to talk about, first issue we want to talk about, is um, um, this business. Uh, I, I want to talk about situations in which there's a, a conflict between what's good for the individual and what's good for the group, or what's good for the species as a whole. Um, Dawkins talks about this. He talks about the, uh, what he considers the fallacy of group selection. We'll see a little bit lecture that that may not be quite such a fallacy as Dawkins thinks. There's strong points of view on various sides on this. Dawkins is taking in the book what has been the majority biological view, although that view maybe it seems to be a little bit in the process of changing. We'll talk about that a little bit next time. In any case, there are lots of situations in which um, uh, individuals uh, basically have to make a choice between doing something that's good for themselves and doing something that is good in the greater scheme of things. Um, good for the group, good for the species, good for the descendants. Well, the descendants are a little bit more complicated, but anyway. Yeah, good for their descendants. Um, and so this is an example of that. I want to show you what happens um, according to the theory of natural selection. Suppose you have a situation in which there are two um, alleles, or two genotypes, two, two types of animals. One uh, type, um, what we we'll call type M, has, a, the, the, sorry, these guys, these animals, um, live by eating grass. They're grazers. Um, and the uh, maximal grazers, the M types, basically if there's grass there, they eat it. And if, it's, you know, if, it's, if it's long, lush grass, they'll probably eat that first. But if there's not, they'll eat it right down to the ground. Now, the problem with eating grass right down to the ground <laughs> is it doesn't come back. Okay, so it's a very maladaptive thing to do in the long run. If there are lots of animals and they all eat it down to the ground, this is going to be the last uh, year in which uh, that species has anything to eat. So it's, it's not a good thing to do in the long run, 
but of course, it's great for the individual, at least for the short term, it's great for the individual who does it, because they can eat more, they can uh, raise more kids, they can have more offspring, da 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 da. Um, the other uh, allele, the other type, is the type R, which has a, a gene which confers on its holders a restricted grazing habit. That is to say, they won't eat grass blades that are, are less than a half an inch long. So, and even if they're starving to death, okay, they just won't eat more than, you know, they, won't, they won't eat down beyond that, which um, is obviously not as good for them under certain circumstances as with this bee, but uh, it preserves the grass. The grass uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't get killed off by it. Okay, now I'm going to make a lot of scales like this in, the, in, in, in these lectures. Um, and so let's look at what this is. Um, this is a scale. Uh, these two, uh, these two, in this example, and in most examples we'll talk about, uh, where we have two alternative possibilities, um, it's either one or the other. Everybody's either one or the other. Um, and so, um, one extreme, we have 100% restricted grazers, um, and that means 0% uh, maximal grazers. And at the other end of the scale, we have 100% maximal grazers and 0% restricted grazers. Now, first thing that I need to say, I, I, for these pictures that I'm going to draw a lot of this time, I have to make a little bit of a caveat. When I say 0%, I don't really mean absolutely 0%, I mean almost 0%. Because once the gene dies out totally, you have to wait for a new mutation, which might bring the gene back, and that, that, we don't want to consider that case. So when I say 0%, I just mean almost everybody is the other thing, but not quite. Um, so that's why I put the little squiggle here, meaning approximately. So almost zero, but never totally zero. OK, so suppose you have a situation. Um, suppose natural selection is the rule of the day. Um, and suppose you had um, a situation in which almost everybody um, was restricted type grazer at some point in time. Um, in the next generation, what would happen? Would you have uh, the same number, of uh, the same percentage of Rs? Or would the percentage of R's go up, or would the percentage of R's go down? How many think it would stay the same? How many think that it would go up? How, what, sorry, how many think it would go up? You can raise your hand. Be brave. Um, how many think it could go down? It would go down. Sure, it would go down. Um, and um, by the way, I didn't quite all obey my rule. Let's try that again. I, I, I told you the answer, but let's do it anyways for good practice. Um, how many say it would go up? How many say it would stay the same? How many say it would go down? Much better, thank you. OK, um, as I said, if you don't know the answer, guess. Uh, I mean, if you don't think you even, if you, don't, don't, if you have any idea at all, vote that way. And if you don't, if you don't, don't have a clue, um, either do it something at random or do what somebody else did. In any case, um, so uh, yeah, it would, um, it would go down. That is to say, you would get a movement in the direction of more maximal grazers. Maximal grazers would be an advantage. And the reason that the, 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 the uh, uh, trade in the next generation, the maximal grazing trade in the next generation would go up, is those guys who did eat beyond half an inch would uh, both be able to survive better themselves, especially if it was a scarce year, um, and they would be able to have more offspring that would successfully live to reproductive age, and so on and so forth. And so since they would have more offspring, that gene would become more common in the next generation relative to the other ones. And everybody's got to be one, or that allele would uh, be, be more common in the next generation, since everybody, by definition, in this example, has to be one or the other. Um, so it would move in this direction. Um, now, what would be best for the species? R or M? R, sure. R would be obviously better for the species, but that's not what happens. Not, at least not according to the theory of natural selection. If natural selection is operating, that isn't what's going to happen. Um, so this is a very nice example, um, and this is an example basically taken from dolphins, although I spelled it out a slightly different way. Um, this is an example um, of the fact that natural selection, uh, when faced with this sort of situation, uh, does things that are good for one's short-term reproductive success. Not it does, Natural selection does not take into account in any way the good of the species or the long-term uh, over generations consequences and so on. Um, okay. Well, that's just what you just said. That's what happened. Um, 
Now, we call um, this trait R um, an evolutionarily unstable trait, or, or, or Dawkins calls it an uh, evolutionarily unstable strategy. Strategy is a lot of the thinking about um, evolution has come over from economic theory. Um, and um, there it's, we talk about strategy, we talk about strategies, but here it's really, it's, a, it's, it's an unstable trait. Um, but Dawkins carry, and a lot of people in, 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 uh, of this time type uh, use the word strategy, but, but, but I'm not going to do that. Um, anyway, it's, 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 this trait or characteristic is evolutionarily unstable because its holders will have less progeny who survive. They will have lower reproductive success, especially when food is scarce. So the bottom line is that in this kind of situation, um, natural selection, at least in its simplest form, selects for current reproductive success, even if it means ultimate self-destruction of one's line of descent. That's a rather significant thing. Now, um, one can see lots of examples of this in real life, and Dawkins will talk about these as well. Um, uh, so one sees a tendency to do things to provide short-term gain, despite the fact that it will lead to disaster for descendants, even in hum human populations who have the advantage of reasoning and foresight. Um, one example is in England. There used to be all these common grazing lands, common, um, where anybody could graze their sheep. But um, people didn't use the resource wisely. They, uh, the, some individuals overused it. Uh, killed off the land, let their sheep overgraze, um, and uh, it was good for them, but it wasn't good for the descendants. And the result is there are no longer commons in England, common grazing lands in England, at least very few. Um, even though humans have the benefit of reason and foresight, um, they by and large uh, forego, they by and large go for short term gain unless they use their mental faculties to construct institutions that will force them to behave, to pass laws. The Congresses can pass laws, which they, I mean, they can reason, they know what's going to happen. Uh, so that they can pass laws which will force people to do the right thing. And, you know, I think we all know current politics well enough to see, uh, uh, you know, this, this kind of thing playing out one way or another in, in, our, in our currently. Um, but when we do pass such laws, when legislatures do pass such laws, there's a large segment of society that objects. Unfortunately, natural selection tends to create individuals who tend uh, not to take the long run into account. I know I'm saying it over and over again. It's very important. Oh, into account in their personal decision. And I uh, was added this uh, this morning when I was uh, uh, looking at it. And I said, I am reminded of objections by certain congresspersons, no names, to laws that require us. There are, people have passed laws, as you probably realize. Uh, uh, past laws would say that you can't sell incandescent light bulbs anymore. You can only sell low energy light bulbs, low wattage, or not low wattage. Well, yeah, low wattage, not dim, but low wattage light bulbs. They give off a little funny light, so on and so forth. They're not people. Some people, a lot of people don't like them. I don't like them particularly, um, but there are obvious reasons for doing it. Those laws were passed because we obviously, you know, we, uh, we don't do things like that. Bad things are going to happen. Um, but there are an awful lot of people who say, oh, well, um, it needlessly limits our personal freedom. Okay? Uh, and that's really kind of the same thing going on. And it just goes on endlessly. So one should be aware of it, that it's a natural human trait. It's just exactly what natural selection would uh, predict. Okay, that's uh, our first example. Second example. The second situation that I want to talk about is one in, what, in which um, what natural selection predicts in certain cases of inter-individual competition. Um, now, there are various strategies that individuals can have to competition over scarce resources of one sort or another. Um, and Dawkins talks about a number of these. Um, and he first talks about uh, what he calls the uh, hawks and ducks, and that's all we're going to talk about here in class. He talks about some more complex uh, strategies or, or, or possible traits as well in the book. I'm just going to focus on these. So um, the term hawk and dove uh, comes from uh, uh, wars and warfare and, and policy decisions about conflict. Um, it was, the, the terminology arose during the Vietnam era war. Um, and um, hawks are defined for our purposes and for Dawkins' purposes 
as individuals that when two individuals meet over some contested resource, um, a, a hawk basically goes all out. If the other individual gives away easily, fine, um, the hawk gets it. If the other individual doesn't get, give away easily, then they fight. And if they're two hawks, they'll fight to the death. One, and so the one that wins gets the resource. Um, a dove has got kind of just the opposite strategy. If um, a dove, two doves come up to a, a, a contested resource, um, they'll threaten one another. They'll try to scare the other one off. Okay, that, but that doesn't cost them much. Um, they'll, you know, this one will say, get away! And the other one will say, get away! And they'll go on that, like that for a while, and eventually one of them will say, oh hell, and walk away. Um, and the one who's left gets it. So it doesn't cost anybody too much, and, and somebody gets it. Of course, if a, dog, if a hawk and a dove meet, the outcome is obvious. Uh, the uh, dove might conceivably threaten, uh, <laughs> and the, the, the hawk goes after him, and, and the dove runs away, and the hawk gets, gets, gets whatever the commodity was. Um, so um, those are the characteristics of what dolphins define, and dolphins call hawks and doves. Now, um, suppose that almost everybody were a dove. Is that an evolutionarily stable strategy or a stable uh, trait? No, very much not so. Doves are at a tremendous disadvantage under that situation. They're always getting, uh, the, the hawks are always winning out. The reproductive success of the hawks under these circumstances could be much higher. So it's going to move, uh, I guess I don't have it there. It's going to move in that direction. Um, okay, now, and similarly, if it's over here, if almost everybody is a hawk, Okay, well, that's a little more interesting. If, if everybody's a hawk, is that evolutionarily stable? No. no, because they're killing each other. Bad news. If everybody's a hawk, it's great to be a hawk if there are lots of doves around. But if almost everybody's a hawk, you can't. You sort of have this image. It's like a battlefield with dead bodies littered everywhere and so on and so forth. It's really a bad scene. Bad to be a hawk. Um, and so it's not that it's going to move this way if it's over here. The proportion of, of, of doves or whatever is over here. It's going to move this way, and if it's over here, it's going to move that way. I'll get you in just a second. Um, and so the question becomes, where does it come to rest? Yes? Uh, okay, so I understand that if there's all hawks, they would kill each other, but I don't understand how the number of doves would increase because the hawks... Everybody's either a hawk or a dove. But there is only one thing. So what would happen, what happens is, if, if almost, remember, it's never the case that there are none of the other things. So if almost everybody's a hawk, what happens is that whenever two hawks meet, they, you know, they, they, one of them dies off. So that's, that, that, that's bad news for hawks. The other one does get the food. But doves, just, you know, they find some food when there's, if it's not contested. Occasionally they meet another dove. So in the long run, they will increase at least some. And the question is, how much do they increase? They may not increase a lot. They may only increase a little bit. How much they do increase depends upon what the payoffs are. For these things. Um, and so Dawkins says, okay, let's talk about evolutionary success or reproductive success points. And we, you know, he doesn't translate into exactly what that means, but the idea is high points means you have good reproductive success, and low points means you have bad reproductive success, and negative points means you have very bad reproductive success. Um, so his point system that he proposes, this is the one he uses in the book and the one I will use, is if you get food from the, out of an encounter, it's worth plus 50. Um, if you get serious injury or death, it's minus 100. Now, I would have said minus 1,000, but that's, Dawkins says minus 100. Um, and what he also assumes is that there's a dove-dove encounter, there's a cost, just to the encounter per se, because they posture back and forth and they waste a lot of time, but they could instead spend going off and looking for some other resource somewhere else. So he gives that a minus 10. Now, if I had been making this point system, I would have also had some negative points for a hawk walk encounter. Right, because they're fighting, and they're really you know, a lot of energy, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but he doesn't do that, and so I'm not going to do it either. Um, okay, so that's his point system. How do we use that? Well, uh, in order to go, and, and, and he, he, he does this, and he uses it, he does it in sort of a verbal way. I'm going to be a little bit more formal about it. Um, and um, in order to use this point system, let me just take a little bit of a digression into uh, gambling or theory or game theory, or economic theory. Suppose you have a lovely game in which you toss a single die 
Um, and if it comes up a one, you get ten dollars. If it comes up a two, you get five dollars. If it comes up three through six, you get one dollar. It's a good game. Can't lose. And um, so the chances of that happening are one six. Uh, that the chances of that happening are one six, and the chances of that happening are four six. Question is, what will your average winnings be over lots of plays of this game? Um, and the uh, way you calculate it is it's um, one six times that payoff, the probability of that happening times that payoff, one six times ten dollars, plus one six plus the probability of that happening times that payoff, which is one six times five dollars, uh, plus uh, 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 the probability of this happening times that payoff, and that's four six times one dollar. Average that all up, and the over a long number of plays, a lot of plays of the game, you'll earn on the average at three dollars and sixteen cents per play, uh, per per toll. Um, okay, we can generalize that. Um, if you have uh, any game, uh, whether it's economic or evolutionary, or gambling or whatever, um, you have a variety of outcomes. I'll just put three here, um, and each one has a probability associated with it. Put P A P B. C, each one has a payoff, W A, W winnings A, winnings B, and winnings C. And the average winnings per play is just a, it's just a generalization of this, are P A times W A plus P B times W B plus W C times W C. It's, it's, it's plausible. You, you know, it may not be obvious that that would be the rule, the, the calculation, but it, it's right, um, and it makes, it makes sense. Okay, so we're going to use that little formula a lot. Now, let's then look at this um, hawk dove game in this sort of way. <clears throat> um, let's first of all look at the situation for a typical um, um, dove, uh, Timothy dove. Okay? We see some individual, and Timothy's going out into the world. Um, Finding some little bits of food, and they may well be contested. Um, uh, we're going to assume that they're all, we're only going to look at the cases where they are contested. Um, and if they are contested, they might be contested by a hawk, or they might be contested by a dove, because there's some of each of those in the population. Um, so he might compete with a hawk. He might compete with a dove. What's the probability that he'll compete with a hawk? Well, or let me, let me go this way. What's the probability that Timothy will encounter another dove? Well, it depends upon the proportion of doves in the population. If there are lots of doves, he's very likely to. If there aren't many doves, he's less likely to. So basically, the probability that he competes with a dove is just the proportion or pro proportion of doves in the population, which is the probability that he'll encounter a dove. So we'll call that PD. We don't know what it is. That's essentially what we're trying to find out. What we want to know is over lots of plays of this game, with natural selection doing its thing, um, with this point system, um, this evolutionary uh, uh, um, Reproductive success point system. What will the proportion of doves be over the long run? And of course, everybody, since everybody who's not a dove is a hawk, if the proportion of doves is PD, then the proportion of hawks, which you could call PH, is one minus PD, because everybody is one or the other. Um, okay, so there's a probability, which we don't know the what the value is, of PD here, and probably one minus PD that Timothy. He's going to compete with a hawk at any given encounter. Okay, and now Timothy may win or lose. We can e it's easy to assess the probabilities of that. Um, the chances that Timothy will win if he meets a hawk are zero. So, okay. chances that he will lose are certain. So that's one. On the other hand, if Timothy competes with a dove, the randomly chosen dove. So you know it's just even odds. So the half chance, uh, 0.5 chance he'll win, or 0.5 chance. That he'll lose. He'll win 50% of the time and he'll lose 50% of the time, even on. Okay. If and suppose each of these outcomes occurs, um, uh, what does or his consequences for him? Well, it doesn't matter what the consequences are if he competes with a hawk because uh, he he he, he uh, um, never wins. And, you know, it doesn't matter if, if he wins against hawks; it doesn't ever happen. So I wouldn't bother. But um, if he competes with a hawk and loses, which is what's going to always happen if he competes with a hawk. Um, no harm, no hurt, no food, but it gets over with quickly. It gets scared away in a hurry. No, give them just a second. No delay. Um, so that adds up uh, uh, zero, zero, zero. So basically, no points. Yes. Is there a reason we're not giving minus ten for the delay that it takes to like? That one, there's there's a delay in a dove dove encounter because they go back and forth a lot. Okay, but dove hawk encounter, the hawk scares them away so fast. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um. 
okay, so what about over here? With, uh, with Timothy meets um, um, it's Dove, another Dove, and he wins. Um, there is that that time thing we were just talking about, so he gets minus ten there. So that's a little cost. The cost minus ten is the cost. It's not a winning; it's only a cost because that's why it's negative. But he gets food, so that compensates. So the two together sum to plus forty. So he gets something, but he gets some evolutionary points, but he not as much as he would if he just had the food. So it goes down to forty. Uh, Fifty minus ten. Um, if he loses, um, he doesn't get any food, but he does have his time cost, so it's minus 10. Okay, so now let's put that all together. Well, first of all, um, the net winnings, if he competes with a dove, um, are one half times that plus one half times that, one half times that plus one half times that, and that, if you do the arithmetic, comes out plus 15. So that's... Um, so the overall average payoff for a randomly chosen dove, in this case it was Timothy Dove, who we chose randomly, is going to be 1 minus PD uh, plus PD, because we now put these back in. The probability, so, sorry, I can say I'm show you that. Right, sorry. So um, zero points with a probability of 1 minus PD, that's PD times zero, plus 15 points times the probability of that, which is uh, PD, so that's PD times 15. Put it all together, and the net average overall payoff um, for being a dove in this kind of contest is 15 times PD. Yes? Well, um, if it chooses a hawk, why is it no person? It, sorry, if you compete to the hawk, what? Why is it no person? Like, if you compete to the hawk, the hawk just scares them away and runs away. They don't have a fight. Uh, it's only the hawks that fight with it. Doves never fight. Okay. That's kind of the definition of a, hawk, of a dove. Um, okay, now let's do it ourselves um, for, um, what about if we have a typical, um, typical hawk, Brunhilde hawk. Um, so, let's see, we have, uh, So Brunhilde might compete with a make it the same way a hawk. Or might compete with a dove in any given encounter. She might win, or she might lose. Thank you. Did you go? I never did spell. I got G's in spelling. Um. <coughs> okay. Win. Lose. Um, okay, let's see. So, first of all, um, what are the chances that she will, uh, that Brynhilde will win if she competes with a hawk? Hmm? Sorry, did I say what? No, no, sorry, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. What are the chances she will compete with a hawk? Sorry. PH or 1 minus PD. And what are the chances she'll compete with a dove? Right, because that's who she's going to, that's the odds of running into a dove depends upon the portion of doves in the population. Okay, what are the chances that um, she will win or she competes with the hawk? 50-50, hmm? right. So one half, one half. Um, what are the chances that she'll win or she competes with the dove? Good. Okay, now the payoffs. Um, so if um, she wins against a hawk, what are the points? 
Minus what? 100. If she wins? She won't get injured if she wins. It's the other guy that gets injured if she wins. Well, otherwise, the guy leaves still fights to death. Yeah. No, well, no, okay. So, in Dawkins' point system, when two hawks fight, the winners um, um, get food, um, but there's no cost. If the one that loses gets minus 100 because they get killed. I said, I thought that was silly. He should have included a cost for the counter per se in a hawk-hawk encounter, but he doesn't. And I want to do it the same way he does it. So in Dawkins' point system, if you win, like when fighting another hawk, you don't, it, it doesn't cost you anything. That's really kind of dumb, yeah. but that's the way he does it. And I want to do it the same way. So. Sure. Well, I don't, nobody ever said Dawkins is dumb. <laughs> I've heard he's mean. I don't know the guy. <laughs> but I don't think, I'm sure he's not dumb. Um, okay. Um, I would like to be so dumb. Okay. Um, so um, he's going to get food. So that's plus 50, and that's the only point consequence if he, uh, if he wins. If he loses, what happens? Minus 100. <coughs> um, suppose he competes with the dove. If he wins, hmm? if he loses, zero. It doesn't matter. It never happens. Right. Um, okay, so over here we have, um, if he competed with a hawk, it's going to be one half, one half times 50 plus one half times minus 100 equals um, 1550 divided by 2 is 75. Is that right? Um, and um, if he, did I do that right? Oh, sorry, negative. No, sorry, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do it right. What is it? What's the answer? Negative 25. Minus what? 25. Thank you. Yeah, I added. I forgot the minus sign. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and if he uh, here, he's guaranteed to win, so it's just 50. No matter what. And so overall, um, the overall winnings on the average are going to be 1 minus PD, 1 minus PD times minus 25 plus um, PD. Times uh, 50. Um, okay, so that's now done the calculation for hawks and done the calculation for doves. Um, uh, and this uh, basically, this little thing here simplifies uh, slightly to. Where did it go? Wait a second. Simplifies to that. Um, okay, so that arrow was there because I raised something I forgot to raise the arrow. Um, okay, so we have the following situation then. Um, we have that the average payoff for doves is 15 times PD, and the average payoff for hawks is 75 PD minus 25. Okay. Now, um, well, obviously you've got two equations with one unknown, and you can solve. Okay, um, you can basically figure out from this what PD is. We'll do that in a minute. Um, but um, before we do that, let's just look at this a little bit. So let's go back to our little diagram. There. Suppose almost everybody were a hawk. Um, then we're um, over here, and if almost everybody is a hawk, that is, if PD is nearly zero, then according to the, these formulas, uh, uh, the average dev payoff will be close to zero, and the average hawk payoff will be minus 25. Um, and so therefore, um, that's over here, but if, in this case, it's obviously better to be a dove than to be a hawk, because that's zero and that's minus 25, okay? So therefore, um, doves are going to have more offspring than our hawks, so that's going to move in this direction. We already know that. I'm just showing you the point system that all these numbers do what they should. 
if almost everybody were um, if, if almost everybody were a dove, that is say PD was approximately one, then using the formulas again, the average de dove payoff would be 15, and the average hawk payoff would be 50. Um, and in this case, hawks have higher points than doves, and so it's going to move in that direction. So we already know that. Um, it's just showing you that this makes sense. Now, the question that we're interested in is where does it come to rest? And where it comes to rest, the stable point, occurs when the average dove payoff, which is the payoff in uh, reproductive success points, when the average dove payoff equals the average hawk payoff. Um, and um, that is to say, to uh, take these things, when this equals that. So we've got PD twice, and we can do a little arithmetic. And according to Dawkins, and uh, uh, you can check this for, and should check this for yourself, he says that um, PD under this circumstance equals 7 twelfths. I assume that's right. Make sure he is, because you might have to do something like that on an exam. Um, it is right. I'll tell you about it. Confirm it yourself. Um, so it's 7 twelfths. Um, and the uh, a, a pH is then uh, 5 twelfths, 1 minus uh, uh, 7 twelfths. Um, so um, the first thing to notice then is that uh, the, the, the um, proportion of doves is 7 twelfths, which is it's a uh, little bit, it's about here on the scale. Okay, right about there. It's a little beyond a half. Um, but I have more to say about it. I showed you this for a reason. Uh, but first, uh, before I get to that point, let me, uh, uh, let me ask you something. Um, little quiz. At the stable point, um, the overall average payoff for doves, if we, we uh, uh, the, the probability, the proportion of doves is 5 twelfths. Probability of being a dove is so five twelfths, um, and so that ends up being the average payoff for a dove ends up once is to be six point two five. I'm telling you. Questions: What's the overall payoff, average payoff for being a hawk? Quick. Six point two five. So that's how we got. It. So you didn't actually have to do the calculation. If you did the calculation, it would turn out right. Um, but but that, that so you don't actually have to do it. Okay. So if I ask you that on an exam, catch on. Don't spend a bunch of time doing some complicated calculation. Um, okay. Now, the reason I've shown you this is uh, on this slide. Main reason. Um, so, at the at, natural selection brings the system to a point where the average payoff for being a dove and the average payoff for being a hawk is the same. If it weren't, the proportions would change. They're both 6.25. Now, the question is, is this the best possible solution from the point of view of the individuals involved? Well, if PD were equal 1 instead of uh, uh, um, uh, 7 twelfths, the average dove payoff would be 15, which is a lot better than that, and the average hawk payoff would be much, much higher than that. It would be 50. So it would be much better for everybody if the proportions were different than they are. But because under those circumstances, even though everybody's better off, because somebody's more better off than somebody else, natural selection won't bring you there. So in this sort of a situation, you will always get a situation, you always get an outcome that is bad, that is far from optimal for the individuals. People are fond of saying that, that natural selection is wonderful, it makes perfectly adapted, ideally uh, optimally adapted individuals, and there are circumstances where that is right. But there are also circumstances where that is wrong. And this kind of thing is one of them. Um, so the moral of the story is that evolutionarily stable strategies can be far from optimal. Now this is another example where I want you to not only know the conclusion, which is what I am emphasizing, um, which, um, but also exactly how we got there. In the exam, you basically you have to be able to do all this stuff and understand the argument. Okay, last example. Hmm. I'll start this, I won't finish it. Um, all right, how can altruism arise? arise? Um, we said that an absolute solution comes to make selfish mean spiritedness um, on the face of it, um, and yet we think there are altruistic traits that we have. 
Um, and the question is, how can that happen? How can natural selection bring this about? If we really believe that natural selection is the whole story, and biologists do believe that. Um, then how, how we have to have some way of explaining. Well, there's two possibilities. One is natural selection is wrong, which biologists don't believe. One is, of course, that there are not really altruistic traits. We just think they are, and some people might argue that. Um, but one is there is some way it can happen. And it turns out there are some ways that it can happen. Um, and there, in fact, um, have been at least three different kinds of ways suggested. We're not going to talk about all of them. We'll talk about two of them. Um, one of them is called kin selection. I'm going to explain that to you in just a second. One is called group selection. We'll talk about that a little bit um, uh, in a little while, but that's the one that uh, when Edward, uh, that um, often debu uh, debunks, but in fact, maybe not correctly so. Um, and then there's something called reciprocal altruism, which Dawkins talks about extensively, but I don't think I assigned those parts of the book. Has anybody actually read all the Dawkins stuff that I assigned yet? Well, Did it? Read the whole thing. Uh, does anybody know whether I have you assigned the parts about reciprocal altruism? I can't remember. I don't think I did. Did I? You know? I didn't. Okay, thank you. Um, they're in there if you want to read them. Um, in any case, um, so I've trumped up an extreme case to illustrate this idea of kin selection. Um, and basically, the idea for kin selection is that altruism evolves, can, re can readily evolve, if um, there is an altruistic gene. And even though the altruistic gene may cause the individual who does the altruistic act maybe not to breed at all, maybe to get killed, if by doing it he saves enough close relatives the gene will spread because, of course, the close relatives are very likely to have uh, have a high probability of having the same genes he has, who she has. And so, like, even though he gets bumped off, he saves so many copies of the gene that his altruistic act uh, goes into the next generation. That's basically the idea. I want to show you that concrete. So I've trumped up this example. Um, um, these animals, I just gave them a name. I forget what they call them. I didn't write it here. Eeks, whatever. Um, there's a, there, sorry, that's not the Greek. Um, this is, these are the Greek circles. So um, these animals um, uh, typically um, have litter. Whenever they pair a mate, um, um, these animals um, uh, have uh, one, two, three, I think it's eight babies that they put like a bunch of babies. Always the same. They have a flex side. And these are born in the spring. Um, and they grow in the summer, and by the fall, they are very juicy and ripe. And these little animals um, have a predator who just loves them, and, and wait. They always these predators wait till fall, and then they go after them. And what they do is um, they typically get one attack because one attack kills them all. Uh, one attack, um, and uh, they go after the clutch. And they usually get um, one, two, three, four, five, six out of the eight members of the clutch. A couple get get away, so they, they get most of them. Um, that's what normally happens. However, there there is a gene running or an allele running around which confers on its holders great heroism. And the way these guys express their heroism is when, if they happen to spot this predator, they squawk. Ah! <laughs> And what that does is it does two things. First of all, it allows, it's an early warning call. It allows everybody else but them to escape. But it attracts the attention of this guy, and so they themselves get gobbled up. We'll continue with this next time. Suspense.